My name is James Hill. I'm the Senior Vice President of Administrative Services at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Victor E. Schwartz Law Symposium here at the Hospital Center. We're so delighted that you're here and that you came in out of the bad weather out there, and that we have the privilege of hearing from three very influential individuals about medical malpractice and how we can help avoid or minimize it in our interactions with patients and families. Our moderator and host of the third annual Law Symposium is Mr. Victor Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz is a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of the Kansas City-based law firm of Shook, Hardy & Bacon. He chairs the firm's public policy group, which is in the vanguard of developing public policy that will help improve the civil justice system. Mr. Schwartz is also general counsel to the American Tort Reform Association, ATRA, and working with ATRA and other organizations, he has successfully anticipated and curbed many, uns many unsound trends in the law. Prior to entering the full-time practice of law, Mr. Schwartz was a professor and dean at the University of Cincinnati College of Law. He currently serves on the college's board of visitors, and in 2012, the college established the Professor Victor E. Schwartz Chair in Tort Law. Mr. Schwartz also served at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he received the Secretary's Medal for Professional Excellence. He chaired the Federal Interagency Task Force of Product Liability and the Federal Interagency Council on Insurance. He was the principal author of the Uniform Product Liability Act. Mr. Schwartz is the co-author of the most widely used torts casebook in the United States, Prosser, Wade, and Schwartz's Torts, now in its 13th edition. He is also author of the leading text, Comparative Negligence, and he was the principal advisor for each of the American Law Institute's restatement of torts projects. Mr. Schwartz has published articles which have been analyzed almost, which have analyzed almost every major subject of modern tort and civil justice public policy. His articles are cited and relied upon by judges, and he's a popular speaker in judicial education. He has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and he has appeared on 60 Minutes, The Oprah Show, and other influential media. The Legal Times of Washington named Mr. Schwartz one of Washington's top 30 visionary lawyers. The National Law Journal has also named Mr. Schwartz one of the top, one of the 100 most influential lawyers in the United States several times and listed him in the category of super lawyer each year for the past two decades. Mr. Schwartz obtained his BA summa cum laude from Boston University and his Juris Doctor cum laude, magna cum laude, I'm sorry, from Columbia Law School. He's a member of the bars of New York, Ohio, and the District of Columbia. Victor, we want to thank you again for your dedication, leadership, and vision for creating this annual law symposium and for bringing this great panel together today. Now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming your moderator, Victor E. Schwartz. I wish I had the book here. If I stand on it, I look taller. Uh, it's real big, like you get up like that. Uh, I want to well add to Jim's uh, welcome of everyone here. Uh, this is a very extraordinary audience. There's none that I have an opportunity to speak to that's like this. Any, any three people here could be up on the panel, do as well, but we're here and we'll do uh, our best. It's just a great audience. I appreciate the fact that apart from the many distinguished physicians here, and I know some of them, like Dr. Shockett, he's just so great. <laughs> I'm crazy for Dr. Shockett. Um, the last time I saw him, he was looking at a different end than you're seeing right now. But, <laughs> but there are nurses, hospital staff, technicians, hospital administrators here. Uh, all are vital, connected parts of the hospital and other avenues for providing medical care, and you're kind enough to attend. I also welcome gifts, guests who are not part of the hospital but are interested in this topic. When the series began in 2013, I asked that we have a broad spectrum of all of those who work every day for patients. This opens the door for the title of today's symposium, probing the causes of and providing the cures for medical malpractice. One of the causes of medical malpractice and medical error 
is lack of coordination among doctors, nurses, receptionists, and other staff who are vital in the chain of medical care. In that respect, Washington Hospital Center and MedStar are to be commended for placing a premium on teamwork so the doctors know their nurses, know their technicians, know their receptionists, and those professionals know and exchange information with and thoughts with the doctors. My role today is not as a speaker, but to be a moderator. I want to stick to that because of the very prominent speakers that we have. And just so you all know the format, I remember when I used to teach school, that was important, what's coming up. Uh, each of our speakers is going to speak about five to seven minutes, and then we will have uh, panel discussions with questions, and then uh, you all will have a chance to ask questions. Uh, it's questions, not speeches, just questions. You, know, you, know, you get my drift. Um, our first esteemed panelist is going to be Rosemary Gibson. I'm going to introduce both people, so I don't have to be popping up and down all the time, um, is Rosemary Gibson. She's a famous author and speaker. She is principal author of a book that you probably all know it's called Wall of Science, Sci Silence, Silence, the untold story of medical mistakes that kill and injure millions of Americans. Look. Um, but it has brought about and helped save many, many lives. How many of us have written books that did that? A senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in Princeton, uh, Rosemary was chief architect of a $200 million national strategy to establish palliative care in the mainstream of the U.S. health care system. And it's now at a 1,400 hospitals. It had only been in a few. It's here. Ms. Gibson was the was honored as a recipient of the 2007 Lifetime Advancement Award for the American Academy of Hospi Hospice and Palliative Medicine. So some big words here. Um, Ms. Gibson worked with Bill Moyers on the Public Affairs TV on our own terms, which was shown to more than 20 million viewers about how the American healthcare system can care for seriously ill patients. She supported the work of nurse and physician leaders who launched faculty development programs in palliative care. I finally got that palliative right. I had a world work on that. Revised medical and nursing textbooks to include the care of dying patients and expanded palliative care content on the medical and nursing licensing exams. And initiated a series in the Journal of American Medical Association, Perspectives on the Care at the Close of Life. Ms. Gibson also serves on the MedStar Health Corporate Patient and Family Advisory Council, and we will hear from her in a moment. Our next panelist, um, I know for almost 50 years, uh, Ralph Nader. Uh, you all know Ralph. He is the author and lecturer, an attorney, and a political activist. He was cited by the Atlantic as one of the most 100 influential figures in American history. I mean, like Columbus doesn't know. He's in, like, <laughs> people like that. It's pretty good. In uh, 1965, um, his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, was published. It was blasted the auto industry and wanted to make cars safer. And that led to congressional hearings, automobile safety laws. Um, it really changed uh, America, in, in our vehicles, because we were, then we wanted fins and stuff like that. And, now they're safer. He's had many best-selling books, hundreds of reports dealing with corporate and government accountability. He ran for president four times. Uh, his zone is consumer and work, worker protection, environmentalism, democratic government, and dismantling the corporate state, whatever that means. Um, Ralph Nader's lifelong work has led to safer cars, healthier food, cleaner air and drinking water, and safer workplaces. This is all true. Um, he's helped start federal agencies like OSHA, uh, the EPA, and the Consumer um, Protection Safety Administration. Actually, I agreed with him on that one. He's inspired these groups like Public Citizen, Center for Auto Safety, Clean Water Action Projects, and the Pension Center Freedom of Information Clearinghouse. His newest book, important, is Breaking Through Power. It's a wake-up call to detailing the many ways with those who use uh, wealth and power in the political economy. Uh, 
Mr. Kenner Sanders, you want, oh, Senator Sanders, you want to say something? Yeah, I should, you should read that book. It's a very good book. And um, by the way, uh, why don't you mention that I will only tax the doctors at 28 uh, percent? That's that's it. And I'm going to put all the pharmaceutical companies out of business, so they'll have nobody to sue, and then they can't sue the doctors. Well, thank you, Bernie. It helps. helps a lot. Look, he's right on. He's right on. I love Bernie. Last year, Ralph Nolt launched the uh, American Museum of Tort Law. My friend Debbie and Dr. Goldstein and I went up there. It's quite a place. It's fascinating. If you go up to this little place in Connecticut, Ralph will tell you about it. You should visit it. As I mentioned, Ralph is a friend. Um, and this is just my own life. Uh, I worked on behalf of plaintiffs for many, many years. And in the early 80s, I joined a defense firm. And Ralph heard about this and he asked to see me. From his look and concern, is it was if a rabbi had a son who became a priest. I mean, that was, <laughs> so let's begin with Rosemary. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, I'm really delighted to be here. I never would have thought when I, that subtitle on that book, Wall of Silence, the untold story of the medical mistakes that kill and injure millions of Americans, when that came out, I was mortified. The publisher insisted on it. And I never would have imagined that here at Washington Hospital Center, we, we would have created a culture 13 years later where we could actually have a conversation with Ralph Nader and myself on this. That's a testament to how far you have come but as you all know, as you dig deep and you start looking, we have a long way to go. I'm going to start with my own safety moment. It's a little bit different from how you start your meetings here with a safety moment. And it's a tribute to uh, you, Mr. Nader. About eight years ago, I was uh, uh, in a, uh, invited to give a talk in Alabama on patient safety. And my host was driving me back to the airport. And we were on the interstate, and it was raining lightly. Up ahead of us was, were a lot of brake lights, and suddenly cars were piling into one another. And I looked at my host who was driving. He jammed on the brakes, and about 40 miles an hour, we had impact in that pileup. What is so extraordinary is that everybody in that pileup in the middle of the interstate walked away. The car was completely totaled. Ambulances came, but nobody needed to go in them. I still keep a pair of sunglasses that I was wearing, and it ended up on the back seat with just a, a cut in the frame. And that was it. And my only concern there, standing on the interstate with my roller bag, was how was I going to get to the airport? And lo and behold, there were a bunch of college kids in an old beat-up Jaguar, and they said, oh, well, we're going that way. So I got in and had a big crack in the windshield. I thought, oh my god, what did I get into? They were the nicest kids. And this is a true story. As we were, I put on my seatbelt, which I've done since Princess Diana's accident, <laughs> to be, tell you the truth. Um, I actually thought of Ralph Nader in my mind, and I said, thank God for Ralph Nader. And I also thanked the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people whom we don't know over the past 50 years who made that moment and so many other moments possible. What does that have to do with what we are talking about today in medical malpractice? The causes and cures. One of the most important things about Mr. Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed, is the subtitle. Do you know what it is? It's the designed in dangers of the American automobile. And that's what we have in healthcare. The image I had in my mind while thinking about today was we have the most professionally competent, well-trained people, physicians, nurses, and others, and we put them in Corvairs. And that's how they get around. We're at the beginning stages of trying to understand and go look. So what, what are the causes, the complexity of the system? And unlike the airline pilots, it's still shocking to me that we allow so many devices and pieces of equipment in that sacred space that have never been tested, that we don't know their reliability. Think of the metal-on-metal metal hips. Think of the electronic medical record. 
And if your contract with your electronic health record provider, if it's like others, <coughs> there's no accountability. If there's a software glitch and it results in patient harm, they're held harmless. So where is the accountability? That's one of the causes of what we have today, the sheer complexity. You have one patient in the hospital, and there can be 150 different people taking care of that patient, touching them in some way. What's the solution? It's what you have started here at MedStar, training people in high reliability. I serve on the board of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, and our aim is to train future physicians so they have the knowledge, attitudes, and skills to provide care safely, to understand the risks, to see the system flaws, and to know how to fix them. That's number one. Here's the second cause of why people sue. I interviewed many, many people for the book Wall of Silence. And one of the reasons they sue is because, this isn't a case of patient harm, these are not frivolous cases, is because of how they're treated in the aftermath of real patient harm. They're not told the truth, at worst we lie to them. And the other thing we've done in healthcare, as one family member said, they harm you and they bill you for it. The good news is, here at MedStar, you've started doing something different. You've started being open and honest with people when there is an adverse event. And I worked with Dr. David Mayer when he was back in Illinois. You can have dramatic reductions in medical malpractice claims and premiums if we do the right thing by people. This December, there'll be a case presentation at Franklin Square, one of your hospitals here. It'll be a symposium where it will be an actual case and how it was handled. And I urge all of you to come. That's cause and what we can do to prevent it. And finally, very quickly, something that medicine has not been good at addressing is how do we deal with people who come to work every day and who are not prepared to practice for whatever reason? We're not good at it. So Dr. Jerry Hickson, solution at Vanderbilt, this is a stunning finding. He has found that unsolicited patient complaints are absolutely predictive of physicians who are at risk for medical malpractice. He has a three strikes and you're out, and their malpractice claims and premiums have plummeted 40%. The problem from a society perspective is they leave, but they show up somewhere else because they can still get a license. So those are some ideas about causes and solutions to medical malpractice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clinton. <laughs> Ed, uh, Victor will do an encore, if you want. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, well, in the brief uh, time for the preliminaries here, uh, I'd like to start by uh, saying that when I did Unsafe and Ease Feed, I, I relied in no small measure on uh, trauma physicians who would examine the victims of crashes and then write medical journals on them. And I remember one uh, message in one of the uh, medical journals said that the only cure for crushed skull is prevention, mainly seat belts and, and other uh, padded dash panels and so on. So the, the first thing I think needs to be said is there is a, an incredible uh, built-in irritation within the medical profession of even talking about deaths and injuries. It reflects itself in the indifference of, of uh, people in elective offices to talk about it uh, or to campaign about it. It reflects itself in terms of the lack of data. You go to the AMA and you ask for information about this. Uh, they don't have information about this. Uh, and yet, it's arguably uh, one of the leading forms of preventative violence in the country. Now, there is uh, various estimates, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health uh, on the medical malpractice. They did urban, suburban, and uh, uh, rural hospitals, and they came up with a figure which varied uh, with the authors, but it was between 80 and, 90, and 100,000 a year deaths. That's about 2,000 a week at 100,000. And there are other studies as well. But if you break it down into four categories, one, medical malpractice or negligent procedures uh, by physicians and hospitals. And the second, um, what are called medical errors, which presumably uh, 
do not relate to the competence or lack of, of the physician or hospital. It's just the way the ball bounces in a very complex profession. And the third is hospital-induced infections, and the CDC has estimated 200 to 250 deaths a day in the U.S. from hospital-induced infections. And, uh, and the, uh, the fourth are uh, what might be called uh, adverse effects of drugs. Uh, which uh, are increasing complexity and risk levels are, are less and less known for a variety of reasons. Well, the Washington Post uh, totaled 400,000 deaths under those four categories totally, and they give their source. Uh, whatever it is, it really is right up there with the major causes of death in terms of cancer and heart disease. And, and yet, it's, it's uh, almost never discussed uh, publicly. There are reports on certain egregious examples like Redding, Pennsylvania, Redding uh, California, where the physician uh, put in uh, maybe 10 catheters a, a day at $5,000 a day, um, most of which were not indicated. He, went to, he was prosecuted. And a physician in Rhode Island who put implants in elderly patients to make more money, he ended up prosecuted in, in jail. So we have a, a whole uh, panorama of different causes and different typologies. Uh, but all in all, they result in preventable death and injury uh, and illness. Um, on behalf of the medical profession, there's no profession that works with more serious variables on more unknowns uh, of any profession in the country. The human body is a, a, is a, uh, a challenge, of course. But if you think of all the decisions that have to be made, any one of which can lead to a, a series of harms, uh, you just have to make a very tiny number of them uh, to have a lot of casualties. And a public citizen uh, put his finger on one area, which is that about 5% of the physicians account for almost 50% of the malpractice claims. So that's the first clue as to get the medical boards and the various hospital committees uh, to find ways that they can, in, in full candor, uh, deal with incompetent physicians that, that are incompetent for a whole number of possible reasons, and nobody knows them better than their colleagues, uh, and including nurses, of course. Um, and so if we do get more data, uh, if we do get more discipline, uh, professional discipline, most of the uh, discipline of, of licensed doctors on economic issues, you know, stealing and doing things bad like that. Uh, they're not so much in terms of uh, incompetence or uh, medical mal, uh, malpractice. But it, it all comes down to just looking at this uh, and not taking it so personally. I mean, I've had friends who've stopped practicing because of fear of medical malpractice. And I said, well, how, how long have you been practicing? They said, well, uh, 32 years. Has you ever had a letter, uh, a warning of a suit or a suit? No. But it can happen any time. Well, actually, the number of suits are minuscule, and they're going down, and the jury trials are going down. And uh, what we're seeing here is a, an increasing reduction of the accountability that comes from the law of torts. Uh, it is, is very uh, inadequately applied. Uh, it's very cumbersome. And <clears throat> uh, a lot of lawyers won't take anything that's under $100,000 and, and uh, highly uh, possible damages. Uh, so we have a lot to discuss, but the main thing to discuss is uh, that the essence of the medical profession is prevention. It is not treatment, it is not diagnose, it, it, it's prevention. You're supposed to prevent that which you are skilled to treat. That's the cardinal definition of a profession, whether it's engineering or accounting uh, or, or legal profession, you're supposed to prevent what you are skilled to treat and make money from. That's the difference between a profession and a trade, and there are all kinds of ways which you can discuss in the next rest of the hour on how prevention can be uh, put into effect, and has been put into effect and, and in best practices in hospitals and clinics around the country.
Thank you both. Uh, these questions, by the way, after the last session, I heard from some of the doctors, and a number of the questions are inspired by people in this room, so I don't want to take uh, credit for them, uh, but uh, I want to thank people who were kind enough to do that. And if today, at the end of the day, you say, you know, if this is done again, uh, I really would like to know about this, I would welcome your suggestions. I'm going to first ask questions of each Ms. Gibson and Mr. Nader, and then just throw some questions up for everybody. Your book, Ms. Gibson, is well-researched about medical error, which you uh, have educated all of us is broader than malpractice. From your research experience, where do most medical errors occur? I don't think we know. The most common errors are medication-related errors simply because there are so many medications. But we don't really know. And that study that you cited, Mr. Nayer, about 400,000 deaths, back, just a quick history. In, 2000 and, in 1999, when the IOM report came out to Air is Human, they had the 100,000 figure. There has been no update from any official source since then. There have been some research articles. That 400,000 figure came from the former toxic chief toxicologist at NASA, whose son died of a preventable medical error. They missed his low potassium. And so we aren't even counting. And the whole point is, if we don't count, then we'll, we don't know. We don't have an understanding of where the errors occur. It's mostly the data we have in hospitals. We know nothing about kidney dialysis centers, nursing homes, home health. We don't know. Ralph, from your experience, because you've studied this, where do you think most of the malpractice cases? Uh, I'll get it in a minute. Okay, just, <laughs> where do you, in your, from your experience, where do you think most medical malpractice incidents arise? Well, if, if they're cases, they arise from really egregious uh, negligence or criminal behavior. The really obvious bad case, I mean, the most obvious one, they take, the surgeons took out the wrong organ. Uh, and uh, because those are the ones that end up, you know, moving, uh, moving on the way to trial. But if you just look at it outside the legal arena, uh, the, you know, the answer is all of the above. The victim. I mean, how about doctors who have to deal with medical devices that haven't been adequately tested, but they've been certified? Or doctors who have to prescribe medicines where the ingredients come from unsupervised laboratories in China. There's 120 deaths from the blood thinner, heparin. Uh, so it, 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 that's why I mentioned. When you have a very complex train of inputs, you have to go back and try to cut it off at the most, right. uh, the most wholesale preventive manner. That's why if you're gonna say, look at all the ingredients that, that, that lead to driver error. Oh, and, and it's drinking, and it's distraction, and it's psychological thinking, and whatever, eating, and whatever. And you say, look, you can't deal with all this. You gotta deal with it by uh, crash worthiness. You, you gotta deal with it by interventions that have wholesale uh, uh, successes. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean that you can't use the profession uh, upstream more. You need to focus more on the medical boards. Who aren't, they're, not, they're underfunded, uh, they don't have many investigators, and they're basically influenced by the profession. They're supposed to be investigating. State medical board, <coughs> public citizens has done work on that. Uh, you need to develop uh, some sort of review of the medical device industry, which is exploding in complexity and, uh, and uh, touting and bragging and all the rest of it. Uh, and now the drug companies, where it's pay or die more and more for your patients. It, uh, I've never seen, I don't think any of us in this room have ever predicted the skyrocketing uh, price of drugs. And we're not talking about new drugs, yes. We're talking about what's been in the press uh, that is increasingly rationing or breaking the bank, rationing care or breaking the bank. By that, I mean all professions need to spend 10% of their income funding 
separate professional arms that just deal with uh, prevention, just deal with implementing the medical canons of ethics. That, that, that's really the way to do it, because you're too busy. You can't see patients in the time you want to see them, which causes a lot of problems just so quickly. Uh, and you need an arm that doesn't see patients. It's like public interest lawyers. They really don't have clients and billings and retainers. They, they deal with preventive law. They deal with remedial law. And every profession should have that. Otherwise, you, you're being overwhelmed. Did you know ever meet a doctor who doesn't say he or she is overwhelmed? Totally overwhelmed. Uh, and patients say, I, I don't, don't see doctors looking at me in the eye anymore, looking at the screen. Uh, and it's just going to get worse because there's this powerful vested interest to corporatize the profession, abridge its independence of judgment, and to complicate it all the way to the corporate bank. Well, on the way up, Cassie got me a car, and I was playing with a Da Vinci machine, and it, it was a lot of fun. You push these buttons, and so I may be certified soon to be able to work with that <laughs> device. It had a lot of instructions, but some of them were in Hebrew, and I couldn't read it. Uh, there is, thank you. Uh, there are some doctors and some experts who say that legislation that would preclude the introduction into evidence, Ralph, made by doctors after a medical error has occurred, for example, where doctors and hospital administrators are trying to get to the bottom of what did occur um, toward, toward the goal of preventing these errors from occurring again. As you know, the label for this is the self-critical examination privilege. Could you support anything like that? Well, here's the way I look at it. It has a good benefit and it induces candor. And, you know, doctors don't like to turn other doctors in, no matter how bad they are. Some of the cases are absolutely stunning. How many years a doctor got away, I think it was in Ohio once, uh, even with sexual harassments and things like that. They all fear the doctor will sue them. Uh, and so they just mums the word. But let's assume that it does induce candor. That's the plus side. The minus side is often used as a hugely encompassing embrace of silence. Uh, and it's abused. So my solution would be that it be refereed by the judge in camera on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether it's, the judge thinks it's needed to, uh, uh, to uh, provide the plaintiff with adequate, uh, the adequate evidence the plaintiff needs to make the case before judge and jury subject uh, to uh, appeal. Uh, May I comment on that? Yeah, uh, and each of you feel free to comment on, on what the other person has uh, offered. Uh, there's a, a colleague who is a former United Airlines pilot and um, Vietnam vet, he flew big jets uh, in Vietnam, and he went into a very famous hospital and had uh, an, a very bad outcome that was not a normal complication. A long story short, he's in appeals court in a state in the Midwest, and I said, why don't you look up to see if the judges took any campaign contributions? And it turns out uh, the lawyers, two lawyers from the hospital had given campaign contributions uh, to two of the judges who were hearing his case. So one of the biggest challenges is can, th there are huge barriers, believe it or not, to people who have been legitimately harmed and who've lost their, you know, their means of earning a living. It's very, very, very hard and very, very devastating. It's not for the faint of heart. It's almost like being struck by lightning to be able to win a case if you're a patient who's seriously been harmed. I'm not talking about frivolous stuff here. And these people are devastated. So it's not, we can have all the laws and the expert witnesses, but the judge has to be on the right side of things. But if I just may follow up on this, is that let's take possibly the worst case of professional negligence as a collectivity. How many years has it been known that overuse of antibiotics produces resistance and results in death. 40, 50? You're talking millions of deaths over, the, over those years. In the, in the world, maybe more than that. The profession has never been organized to deal with that. 
the usual response is the patient comes in, the patient's demanding, the patient saw an ad, and if I don't prescribe antibiotic, even if I don't know the cold's bacterial or viral, they'll think that they weren't served properly and they'll go somewhere else. That's not a good enough excuse. And there's actually public data showing the prescribing practices, thanks to ProPublica. They looked at Medicare Part D data, and they put it out on the internet to show the prescribing practices of physicians who build at least a certain number of, of um, visits for Medicare patients. And you see the outliers, not just on antibiotics, but on antipsychotic drugs, on opioids. The national data are there, but you're right, Mr. Nader, we do not act on it. But the drug industries treat you like lay people. You look at the ads in the medical journals by the drug board, you say, are these scientists? How can anybody even look at these? It's as if Madison Avenue was peddling it to someone who does not to spell the name doctor. And you see, this is where a public interest dimension of the profession, 10% tithing, would do wonders. We've had, we've had a health research group run by Dr. Sidney Wolf and that group was singularly responsible over the last 40, 50 years for getting off the market four to 500 over-the-counter or prescription drugs that were ineffective for the purposes for which they were used and therefore, ipso facto, had avoidable side effects. And it started with the Phil Donahue show, it started with worst pills, best pills, and they're still at it. They have a, a a service for patients called Worst Pills, Best Pills, less than $20. A lot of doctors use it. But, but you see, that budget has never been more than six, 700000 a year. Look what it did. Uh, now, where'd they get the information? By professors of medicine, NIH, medical journals. But there's no engine to use the available knowledge unless you have a public interest advocacy dimension for your profession. I mean, the drug companies are totally reckless. They don't care. It's all about bonuses and profits, and now they're going berserk, totally berserk, and the Congress is not up to it because the medical profession, which had the greatest credibility, they put certain letters out, as you've read, some uh, clinics, Cleveland Clinic, and so on. But if the medical profession has an organized wing, that would generate the action that's needed for this out of control pharmaceutical industry. And we're just seeing the beginning of the spiral. I'm gonna jump ahead because of your replies. Direct to consumer advertising by pharmaceuticals companies. Um, we've all heard the ads. They may say something will help you and then in the background it will cause cancer, or hair fallout, all these terrible things. Um, so you're watching this contradiction. Um, each of you, your thoughts about DTC. Prior to 1988, by the way, there was no DTC, uh, direct to consumer advertising, that's the nickname for it. And just for information of people here, there is a wing in the Food and Drug, Drug Administration with 33 employees. Now think of your job, hope you like it, all day, these people watch ads. They come in in the morning, and you may help. Uh, the drug companies can put out an ad before it goes to that office, by the way. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, but once the ad comes out, then they sit there and watch the ads and decide what you should see. What do you each think of this system of direct-to-consumer advertising? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story about um how it started from the inside. I was at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for many years, and on the board was the former CEO of J&J, &J, Jim Burke. And he regaled at a meeting one time about how we got direct-to-consumer advertising. Turns out his brother, Dan Burke, was a head at Capital Cities Television, ABC, the major network. And together, both of them lobbied and contributed to getting direct-to-consumer advertising. Think of that perfect marriage. Pharma companies sell more drugs, and television networks, which were losing money to cable, they had a gold mine. That powerful advocacy is how we got direct-to-consumer advertising. I think it's absolutely out of control, Victor. The harms are not reported to patients, 
And what's deeply concerning is now the drug companies have gotten it to be, it's a First Amendment right, that we have a right to say anything, even if it's not accurate in, in good science. And even the science has become so contorted. What research articles do we believe? The influence on research is so profound that it's hard to know. Even Marcia Angel said this from New England Journal of Medicine editor. She has a tough time believing any of the research that's published. Ralph, do you have oh, thoughts? It ran 4.5 billion last year. It's television, direct advertising, 4.5 4, 4. billion. Uh, and uh, the consoling factor by the promoters say, well, we do have all the side effects, right? Like Victor mentioned. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, it's called the banality of warning. I mean, it's amazing. As a consumer advocate, I never thought they'd get away with it. They actually spend half the ad telling how the drug's going to harm you and kill you and make you go bananas. And, and, or kill you. And, and people completely tune out. Uh, who would have predicted this? A behavioral psychologist. Uh, so you have now, uh, it's been neutralized. Its justification was, well, don't worry, we'll also give the side effect. That has no effect. These ads are promote massive harassment of the medical profession, don't they? You see people who say the ads, you know, they go and they beat up on you. Uh, apart from the constitutional issue, where the Supreme Court provides that corporations are like people, therefore they have free speech rights, um, which is an absurdity, but that's the judge-made law, uh, they should be banned. Uh, they, were, they were banned for years, and the, in Europe they were banned, just like uh, advertising to young children was banned for years on television in Europe, uh, because they, they looked at it as, as exposing children who couldn't distinguish between the programs and the ads as electronic child molestation. Uh, that's all gone. So I, I, I've, I've been uh, watching this burgeoning thing grow, and you could spend 20 minutes, you wouldn't finish describing the deleterious uh, consequences of this. Uh, they, they do like to say it educates the patient to, to go and ask for a prescription or over-the-counter drug, and that helps. Uh, let them do it on the internet now. If they want to do it on the internet, let them do it on, on, on the internet. But to use the public airways uh, for this kind of deception and manipulation and emotional uh, exploitation uh, without any uh, control as to who's watching it, who's the most vulnerable, who's watching it. Anybody can watch it. It should be prohibited just the way it was years ago, just the way tobacco advertising is prohibited on television. One amendment, if I may. Actually, the one good thing about direct-to-consumer advertising is at least we all see the ads that everybody else is seeing. What's happening now is the industry is using social media very effectively. Quick example, do you remember the procedure lap band surgery for overweight? Long story short, I wrote a piece for this for Consumer Reports blog on how that was being marketed. They created a blog for those who had lap band surgery. And by the way, their own research showed that 25% of people asked to have it removed. Think of it, if you have 25% of people who bought a Toyota, or people who bought a Toyota, and 25% of them said, get it out of my driveway. Then they offered, actually, a contest for those who would sign a petition to get the FDA to, um, to allow more people to have this procedure. And whoever got the most signatures would be allowed a free trip to Washington. And they were also giving away free surgeries. Let me uh, mention a, uh, a suggestion that somebody told me, but it has some common sense, because some of these things politically, as you both know, cannot be accomplished. But what about this? Instead of all the mumbo jumbo, because a layperson does not know how to balance risks and benefits, the law, all of you may know, has something called the learned intermediary doctrine. It's accepted in almost every state. That means the drug company, when they're not advertising, can inform you, the learned intermediary, and does not have to inform the patient. That's the law, because you, as doctors, can make that judgment. 
So we have the ads, but it says, and I would just change one word, see your doctor, not call. Guys and ladies, unlike this little fellow, you can't bill your time. See, I can't. So call is fine with me. But see is not good for you. So, I mean, call is not good for you. It's awful. You can't, oh, Mr. You know, 15 minutes with Mr. Phelps. I do it at the end of every day. Um, the, um, so it just, if the ad was simplified and say, well, here's the drug, but see your doctor, and he or she will explain the risk of benefits. That's all. Would that be a better system than what we have now? No, it would be a tweak. I think it promotes. A uh, but, uh, but, excuse me. See your doctor. Doctor's busy. Can you imagine all the ads saying, see your doctor? I mean, it just it's not practical. You've got to take a lot of the profit out of health care. Over, over medicalization and over diagnosis have now produced some very good books from doctors in Johns Hopkins and Duke. Over diagnosis, over medicalization, over drug uh, prescription. And there's no end to it because when you have the profit motive, it, the end is, is infinite. There, it, it, you, you go to Pfizer or Merck and you say, when is enough and enough? It's never enough. It's like going to Lockheed Martin and saying, when is enough F-35 six-fold over cost? It's never enough. There's no break there. That's the problem. And you're taking the brunt of it. And it's just getting worse exponentially as you go berserk with very clever, manipulative ads. On, you have to admire the, the, the genius that goes into these ads. <laughs> Uh, so much so, I wish we had counter ads on TV. Well, let me. Tobacco ads off TV. Let me ask you. The, oh, One sorry. ad you love this. Okay. One. It was coming, and it just it blew Philip Morris off. Here was the ad. The first one was a, a picture of a diseased lung in dying color, and the second was the second scene was that's Marlboro Country. When they saw those kinds of ads coming at them, they just wanted to get off TV. So maybe one solution is to, is to allow more counter ads. That's interesting. Uh, let me ask this then. How, how many of you in the, here have ever seen a trial lawyer ad about a drug where they say nothing about the benefits? but about the risks. You may die of this. There are records, Ralph, where some people have stopped taking medicines to their death because of trial lawyer ads of that kind. Would you regulate those also? Oh, oh, oh. You would. Is, where is this being taped? This is very important. <laughs> would you repeat that? Yes, I agree with you, Ralph. I think that that's good. But, but Re say, regulate them all. You can't do a constitution. <laughs> Well, maybe you, you can if you show that it's for the health and benefit. That's still in front of the courts of the American people. But that you're being fair, and I, I always are, and I admire that. I'm going to go a little bit toward prevention, because both of you think a lot about that. And somebody wrote about what I do. Not that I was smart, but I'm a labeler, uh, whatever that means. I guess I could go and advertise and Ralph would be up to me. But I've talked about the patient's medical malpractice temperature. That's a label. And I think it may begin very early when a person calls a doctor. We have this mechanical system, press one, press two, but you may have seven and there is no seven. Now, what can we do, do you think, to improve, either of you, the initial phone contact in light of the reality that it, might, it may be too costly to just staff every call? Is there anything that can be done to improve that first contact? to reduce the patient's medical malpractice temperature. I love what uh, Dr. Bernard Laun, a noted cardiologist in Boston, he's 92 years old now, and he stood for an hour to give a full talk. He said, I would spend an hour with my, patient, my first patients, my, their first appointment, to take a full medical history. 
And because of what Mr. Nader's talked about, that's so hard to do now because we have engineered out of our system time to talk with patients and each other. Because the system only makes money higher upstream by doing things, by doing a test, giving a drug, performing a procedure. We have to re-engineer back into our days somehow time for talking. And that initial visit for a complex patient, complex condition, there's nothing to take the place of time. A second place where the temperature goes up is what I call the waiting for a lawsuit room. That's where the patient is there, and they're there, and they get madder and madder. And one of them told me that if they weren't sick when they came in there, they might get sick when they come out. Is there anything that can be done, because both of you have studied this stuff, to help that situation can keep the patient's attitude from formulating being ready to sue if something goes wrong? Oh, so this is before there's any harm they, or after any harm? No, they, they haven't seen the doctor yet. Oh, they haven't seen the doctor. And a lot of st studies I've seen show that people's attitude gets all cranked up before you, the doctors see them. And it's an area just to give some thought to, because you're like medical era chief. So is there anything that can be done for that? What would you do if you were a doctor and you have that waiting for a lawsuit room? I have better magazines. <laughs> now that is a construct. Anybody who leaves here and says they haven't learned anything, well, write that down. That's not anything you all know more about that by far. But I, just as a as a consumer, the tone of voice uh, of the person who answers the phone, the variations between doctors who are very good doctors, all of them, let's say, very good doctors. Somehow they hire people who answer the phone nicely and somehow they don't. Or when you're dealing with the billings, the person's pretty nice with the billings, the person's very curt with the billings. And, uh, and, and that's something under your control, right? Absolutely. And you call in and they say, um, I'll, you know, I'll see the doctor and I, I said, where are you? He said he was in Singapore. I was trying to find out where the, you know, he's working for a doctor. But the person who answers that phone, I've mentioned this before as a takeaway. You all know this, but have somebody else, not you, call your office. And sometimes you will find a, it's great, it's terrific, and other times you may say, oh my goodness. So you have, is that the time card? So we're finished? Oh, from the people. All right. Yes. Okay. Yes. People arise. Ask questions. We have a leading plaintiff's lawyer who, who turns down more, more stuff. He's fantastic. So talk to Ken Trombley because he really knows. He's in the front line. He turns down anything but good cases. So Ken, do you have any observations? No? Uh, absolutely. Look. I've cured Hillary of just about everything. <laughs> uh, my name is Thucydides. Thank you. Um, a, a couple comments, a couple of questions. I think one of the things that uh, Mr. Schwartz has just brought out is the fact that there is a extraordinary disconnect between the prevention of medical errors, which is something that we are all committed to and have been, almost all of us, and the tort system. Um, uh, what Mr. Schwartz was talking about were some practical tips so that your patients don't get mad at you and call a lawyer. It has very little to do with medical errors, per se. What you folks are talking about are medical errors, and I think we're all committed to medical errors, but to, to link the two, to link medical malpractice uh, with medical errors as the, sort of the same thing, uh, I think uh, is, uh, is misleading, uh, at the very least. And so I'd be interested uh, in your comments uh, about that. Because to me, if we don't, really, if we don't improve the tort system, the way it works, the cumbersomeness of it, the ugliness of it, and frankly, the unfairness of it, um, uh, we are actually harming ourselves because it gets in our way of actually improving uh, the situation with medical errors. I mean, somebody even mentioned during one of their discussions that doctors are 
uh, at times intimidated about calling out other physicians who are uh, poor performers because they're afraid of getting sued. There's the tort system again. So the tort system's an ugly business in medicine, and my opinion is if we don't fix it in a big way, which I think was one of the great misfires of, the, uh, of Obamacare, of the ACA, um, uh, it's going to get in our way in terms of fixing uh, errors. Second thing, that, so that's a question. Uh, the second thing that, that I would mention is that uh, there's a lot of noise about uh, empowering and disempowering patients. So we don't like the fact that patients uh, are poking the doctors to give them antibiotics, opioids, all sorts of other things that we think are detrimental. And yet, what's coming? MACRA is coming. MACRA is going to have uh, patients evaluate their physicians. So you come to me and you want an opioid, you want an antibiotic, and I sit down and talk to you about it. You walk away unhappy, I get a black mark, I get paid less. So you can't have everything in this life. Uh, and I would tell you that. Uh, and I think that's important. I think that's important to, uh, to recognize. Uh, and the same thing is true with patient empowerment in general. I mean, talk about direct-to-consumer advertising. Uh, and this is all part of empowering consumers, or at least comes under the rubric of empowering consumers. I think many of us feel it doesn't, but that's what it looks like. So I would add, and the last comment I would make is it's great to spend an hour with a patient, and many of us do that. It's terrific. There's no substitute for time. I'm not going to ask you what trial lawyers make per hour, but I'm going to tell you that what Medicare pays a doctor to sit with a patient for an hour you cannot survive practicing medicine in Washington, D.C. It is impossible. So I would leave you with those comments and questions. Thank you. Well, I'll start with, take the last one. You're absolutely right. The piecework way that we pay does not allow that to happen. And there's a reason, I think, why we have that piecework. I think there are very powerful forces that want to sell and, and sell more devices, more procedures, more things, rather than allow physicians to take the time to do it right the first time. Um, and that goes way, way upstream, and that's above the pay grade of everybody here in this room. Um, I remember talking to a, a former J&J &J, um, individual who, I asked him, um, we were at a, an event about why there's a nursing shortage. You know, J&J &J has been very much into that. And I said, well, I hear that there's also a shortage of pharmacists. And his reply was, well, we think that's a good thing. And I said, well, why is that? He said, because they tend to substitute generics for our brand name drugs. And so that says to me, well, why is it that we have a shortage of people trained in geriatrics? Why do we have a shortage of primary care physicians and family physicians that are paid the least? And I come to the conclusion that there's a reason. There's a very powerful reason that we have very high upstream the allocation of money the way it is. Uh, and that's a big fix. Unfortunately, it all comes onto your shoulders when that patient comes into the room. And they've been, they've been socialized to say, I want that drug. I feel empowered. I want that surgery. I have my insurance card, and I have a right to get it. It's the completely wrong message. Um, completely wrong message. Ralph, last bullet answer. You, you know how to do the bullet answer. Just a couple of short things. I, I, I think, again, it's the process of simplifying the, the preventive impact. Insurance companies should loss experience doctors. Uh, you, there's a case, for example, in Massachusetts where a neurosurgeon was responsible for three quarters of the claims over a certain period of time. And he was paying the same insurance premium as all the other neurosurgeons were paying who didn't have the claims. So they've got a, the insurance company's really just raking it in. They're making so much profit, their reserves are almost like endowments now. Uh, and the doctors are not skeptical enough about uh, the medical malpractice insurance companies, even the bedpan mutuals. They behave the same, uh, the same way. The, the second uh, point I just wanted to make, if you want to deal with uh, fear of bad doctors suing you if you expose them. There's very simple organizational change inside hospitals, especially one this size. You have an ombudsman. All complaints to the ombudsman are confidential. 
by doctors, nurses, whatever. The ombudsman is skilled and, you know, knows how to d deal with the, the complaints. And then the ombudsman has a direct line to the CEO. So nobody is going to fear retaliation. No one's going to fear being sued. Uh, they'll be filtered out. The ombudsman then goes straight to the CEO. So the CEO does not have denial capability. And after, I recommended that to GM after the ignition switch. And they didn't want it because it works. Instead, they reorganized the, the structure, you know, with the new vice president in charge of safety. But that's the way you deal with the fear, inhibition, uh, don't want the problems of, of, of examining and revealing what only you know uh, on the inside of what's going wrong. That's very important to do that. It, it, the executives at the top of any large organization are often insulated in a whole variety of ways. I mean, I mean over the years, they've worked at it. And you, you have to make sure they don't have deniability. And corporate executives in the business world work overtime into all kinds of tears and screens and everything. Uh, but you've got an ombudsman straight to the CEO. You've got a system that helps the well-meaning people. The majority of the people are well-meaning in the hospital. And by the way, on the advertising, the, the way to deal, I, I don't mean to say that all advertising should be banned and it can't be because it's unconstitutional. Even advertising by lawyers or doctors or companies, drug companies, can be uh, challenged in terms of deceptive practicing. The deceptive practicing uh, responsibilities of the Federal Trade Commission and other regulatory agencies. So they say, okay, you've got a right to advertise, but you still have to meet standards of accuracy. Well, the FTC thinks it doesn't have power over lawyers. We've tried that, but you never know. Uh, Bernie, last word. Look, I just want to say this right now. I know what Cruz did yesterday. I'm announcing now Ralph Nader is going to be my vice presidential choice. I want to thank you both. Thank you all for being here.